Good morning. How are you guys doing this morning? So glad that you made it. About six o'clock this morning, I wondered if any of us were going to make it. It's a lot of water, a lot of rain, a lot of lightning and thunder. We're so glad that you guys all braved that uh, and made it, made it here this morning. We've got a great morning uh, in store for you, and I, and I hope that it's a blessing and encouragement to you. Uh, my name is Chad. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm the missions pastor here. And uh, today is Mission Sunday, so we get to talk about what God's doing uh, through this church. Around Today, for specifically, we're going to talk a lot about what ha- what's happening in our community uh, and, uh, and so we're so excited to get to be here. Uh, I want to ask a question as we get started. Uh, how many of you like to fish? Do you guys, anybody fish in the room? There's like, a, okay, there's some hands. Some of you are like, eh, I'm not going to raise my hand. Um, have you ever had one of those fishing days where everything goes really, really well? I'm going to tell you about one. I used to live in Seattle. For 10 years, I lived in the Seattle area. I was a pastor there, uh, graduate from college there. Uh, I was in the army there. And uh, one of the amazing things about the Seattle area is just the incredible natural beauty of the place. If you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. Well, there's fishing and hiking and camping and everything you can imagine for an outdoors person. And, uh, and so every year, about the time August, September, there was uh, the salmon runs. They run up the rivers and, uh, and it just gets amazing. And, uh, and sometimes you go to the river and it's just so full of people, you can't even find a space to fish. Uh, but there was this one day, my two brothers and I, I've got a picture you guys might want to, the kids can see, I was skinny back then, but we, we went out on the, the Snohomish River and uh, we had a, a friend of mine's boat that we used and we, we knew of a pocket, there's a hole in the river that goes deep. And, uh, and there was a lot of boats, but there was no one on the pocket. So we went over and tied up to a little uh, stump and started casting. And within seconds, we all had fish on. You know, when you catch those fish, you're like, fish on! And you're so excited. You're pulling on it. We had multiple times where all three of us had fish on. And we were all pulling. And, and, uh, and so within a half an hour, we caught our limit, which was four. And that's the picture you see there. That's all the 12 fish we brought home that day. But we stayed for another couple hours, and it was just catch and release, catch and release. So almost as soon as you can get the lure in the water, uh, the fish were biting. And they're all 8 to 12 pound pink salmon, and it was, uh, it was fantastic. Well, one of the things that happened is the boats around us weren't catching fish. You know, they're all, they're all around, and they can see us. We're yelling, fish on, every couple seconds. And they're like, so what happens is the boats start getting closer and closer and closer until you really can't even cast. And they're all really irritated because they're not catching fish, and we're catching every, every few seconds. And uh, so after a few hours, like, well, we've had a great time. I guess we should leave. And there was almost a fight when we left to tie up to that stump and take over that space on that, 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 um, that hole in the, in, the, in the river there. And I want you to think, if you've ever been on a fishing day like that, like how did it feel, right? Uh, How does it feel when you catch that fish and and something's pulling on the other line? Uh, We lived in the valley for 10 years, and one of the fun things is you could drive to South Padre Island and fish in Laguna Madre or off the the jetty down there, and you don't know in in the ocean just how big the thing on the other end is, right? You always wonder, and it's just such a thrilling feeling, feeling. Today we're going to talk about two fishing trips that the disciples made uh, that we taught that, that you can read in Scripture. And the first one's found in Luke chapter 5. If you'll turn there with me. <clears throat> Before we get to it, I want to show you another picture. Uh, this picture is a guy all by himself fishing on a river. Ha- have you guys seen a picture like this or maybe even done this before? Maybe you're a fly fisherman. And the last thing you want when you walk down to your favorite fishing hole is to see somebody there. Right? And so this picture is just all by yourself. The river's full of fish, and you can just sit there and enjoy all the beauty of nature. Well, we're going to talk about how early in Jesus' ministry, he meets these guys. And we're going to see here in Luke chapter 5 how this fishing trip went. Do you guys know the story? We're going to look at like, so turn with me uh, to Luke chapter 5. One day Jesus was standing, we're in verse 1. One day Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. The people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to push out a little from the shore. So he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let the nets, let, let the nets down for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I'll let down the nets." Have you been on a fishing, fishing trip like that one? Where you go and you spend the whole day trying to catch a fish and you can't get anything to bite? It's a different feeling than the one I described a few minutes ago, isn't it? 
Well, imagine you've been out there all night long, like Simon says here to Jesus, and the, the, the preacher says, don't worry, just put your nets down again, it'll be fine. How do you think you feel at that moment? Like, okay, I'm going to be a good sport, I'm going to be nice, but we already know how this is going to turn out. So in verse 6, he says, when they had done this, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled the partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and they filled both boats, both boats so full that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid, from now on you will fish for people. So they pulled up their boats on the shore, they left everything and followed him. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for your word. And as we consider what it means, Father, to be fishers of men, we ask, God, that you would help us know how to prepare, how, God, to, to see what you're doing around us. Even when it doesn't make any sense, God, that we'd be willing to act when you speak. We pray that you will use us for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. So this fishing story has, has a really big point to it, doesn't it? It's not just about fish getting into the nets. That's a good story, and it definitely convinced the disciples that Jesus was something different. He was out of the ordinary, and he had unusual authority and power. But this metaphor kind of runs throughout the scriptures, and, and this idea that they're going to be fishers of men sets a stage for a major focus of the New Testament, especially in the lives of these disciples. And you see it borne out in a number of different ways. Notice that the fish harvest was so overwhelming that the fishermen, the disciples, and their equipment was underprepared. They were overwhelmed entirely. The worst thing, I think, is when you have a big fish on a line and your line snaps. Right? Or if you're a net fisherman and your net has holes in it and all the fish get out. Do you guys, have you ever done the little thing where you throw out the net for minnows and all of them fall out the bottom when you pick it up? You're like, oh, I had them and now they're gone. It's one of those feelings. So these guys, they're, they understand what fishing means, but they have such an overwhelming catch that they're not able to, to capture the whole thing. In fact, their equipment, I don't know if you've been in a sinking boat. How do you feel in a sinking boat? And it's not a good feeling. So if you have so much fish in your boat that your boat is sinking, what's going to happen to the fish? They all get away, right? And so this is such a beautiful thing. I love Peter's objection, by the way. Master, we fished all night, didn't catch anything. It's like a, I know what you're thinking, but it's not going to work kind of, a, kind of a, a, an idea here. And Jesus isn't, isn't deterred at all. So this really sets the stage for what I would call as Jesus' dynamic model of discipleship and training. He didn't take them to a classroom and teach them about well, how, how you're going to get more fish in the boat. He didn't tell them what they need to do to tie the lines or, or get prepared. But he started walking with them and said, this is what it looks like to fish for men. And think about that classroom with Jesus. They spent three years with him. What did they see Jesus doing in those three years? How did it go for them? Think about some of the stories that maybe impacted them. If you had time to, to think through all of them, what stories would come to your heart and mind? that stood out, that showed Jesus had extreme, unique authority and power. What, what stands out to you? I, I, I listed a few, um, but you might think of when Jesus stood in the boat and calmed a storm. Do you think that was an important moment for the disciples? Yeah, what, what about when Jesus said, hey, we're going to feed these people, and there were 5,000 just men. How are we going to feed them? Well, we have these, these uh, loaves of bread and some fish, so feed them to the disciples. You remember this story? Jesus prayed over it, and what happened? They fed everybody there. If you include women and children, some estimates put that over 15,000 people. And they had 12 baskets of food remaining. Do you think that stood out to the disciples? What about the story of like the woman at the well where Jesus takes, with all of his power, he sits and talks to this woman he shouldn't have ever talked to. And then through that, all the Samaritans come out of the town and village and meet Jesus and they stay there discipling them and caring for them for several days. What about Lazarus dying? And Jesus says, come out of the tomb, Lazarus. And he walks out and they have to take the, the burial clothes off of him. Like all of these moments are the places where Jesus is showing what it looks like to be a fisher of men, what it looks like to fish for people, to care for them, to draw them into relationship with God. 
There's so many more. He cast out demons. He healed the sick. He preached uh, sermons to thousands of people. He goes from village to village. In Luke, it says he went to every village throughout Galilee. Galilee. There's 200 plus villages. How did they go to all of them? You might think of Luke chapter 10 where he sends them out as disciples to go and and visit these villages and prepare the way. And and they go and he tells them to to not take any money with them. Don't take any food. Go and be with the people there. Let your peace rest on them. And when they welcome you, share with them the love and hope of Jesus. And so they go and they do that. When they come back, he congratulates them and says, well done. I saw Satan fall from heaven because of your efforts and your work. He's training them, his dynamic training in these three years teaches them what it means to be fishers of men. They struggle to really get the picture though. And the way we know that is because when things get really tough, Jesus' crucifixion and, and, uh, and his death, and then of course the resurrection, they're nervous, right? They're really scared. They kind of forget about this whole fishers of men thing for a few minutes. What happens then? Do you remember? They kind of abandon all hope. And Peter says, listen, I don't know what we're going to do. I'm going to go fishing. You guys remember this story? So if you turn with me, it would be John chapter 21. We're going to start in verse 2. It's the second story, the second fishing story. And this is after they spent three years with Jesus. He appeared to them. They knew that he was alive. They knew that things had changed. They still weren't sure what what they were about. And so Peter goes back to fishing. I, I want you to think about just for a minute. If God had called you away from your profession and you knew that he had done something great and you'd walked with him for these three years and you knew all of this and he'd appeared to you at the after the death and resurrection and you know he's real, but you just don't know what's next. What happens if you go back to your profession? What what would that kind of show me or show you? It's almost like a resignation. It's like, I don't know what's next, so I'm going to do what I do know, right? I guess I'm going to go back and fish. It's like this resignation to, to not abandon hope, but, but to go back to what you're familiar with. And so here's the second fishing story. John 21, verse 2, it says, Simon, Peter, um, Thomas, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. Verse 3, I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. They said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Does this sound familiar? (laughs) This is almost a replay of story one. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize who it was. Again, this is another shocking thing. It's like the road to Emmaus kind of a thing, right? These guys are hanging out with Jesus, and they don't even know he's there. So he calls out to them, friends, do you have any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your nets on the other side of the boat. You'll find some. Again, if you're the disciples, you got to be like, how many times can people just think they know better than we do? When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Verse 7, the disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, by the way, you know who the disciple whom Jesus loved? It's the author, right? It's John. Uh, if you ever write a story about Jesus, refer to yourself as the one who's most loved by God. It, it really endears you to the hearts of those who are reading. <laughs> the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning uh, sorry, a fire of burning coals with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some fish you have caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish. Listen, 153. And look at this last line. But even with so many, the net was not torn. And that line to me means so much. Why does John include this second story? Again, it shows the reinstatement. You know what happens after this is Peter is reinstated. Um, It's the reinstatement of of the disciples. It almost re-encourages them to remember that you were fishers of men. The same story. I love that they include the number of fish, 153 large fish. And I love that he says the nets were not torn. What a transformation. There's a moral in that story. The moral of this story is very clear. The disciples are ready 
They're fully formed fishers of men. And how do you know that? Because just a few pages over, if you flip just a few more pages, you get to Acts chapter 2. And what happens in Acts chapter 2? The Holy Spirit comes on the disciples and Peter stands up and gives a strong message at Pentecost. And do you remember how many people come to faith that day? 3,000. The church goes from around 500 people to over 3,000 in a day. And so I ask you, were they ready to fish for men? Were their nets ready to do something very different than fishing for fish? And the story is very clear. Of course they are. And it says that in Acts 2 that they uh, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to prayer. And the very fish they captured became the new fishers of fish. Actually, fishers of men. (laughs) This is the only place where the fish become the fishermen. And so it says after that, that after they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to prayer and to, to eating together daily, all these things, at the end it says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The fishing for men continued generationally until you and I were caught by these same nets. You and I are some of those fish that have been caught in the net of the gospel that helps us know him and know how much he loves us. And so the, the question is, did the generation uh, that Jesus trained, did they do their job well? And the answer is very clear, of course they did. They did it really well, so much so that 2,000 years later, the nets continue to capture the lost and, and give them opportunity to find hope in the gospel. Does that work continue today? Are we fishers of men today? Have we been called to go and make disciples the same way that those disciples were called? Yes, it's a resounding yes we have. Let us not be the last link in those fishermen. (laughs) Let's not be the last link in that chain of people who've been casting and going after the lost throughout history. Let us continue to push forward for the very thing that God has called us to do. Today, uh, when you came in, you should have got this magazine. And uh, this magazine is something we created here at FBC. We, the media team and Robbie, you guys did an excellent job. This is such a, an incredible document. Uh, this is the biggest document we've made since I've been here. It's 36 pages, and almost every page has a different ministry, a local ministry, domestic ministry that we partner with. And so you can look in here and see uh, we partner with Hill Country Pregnancy Care Center and, and how to contact them, how you can volunteer with them. If you flip a few more, there's a story about uh, Christian Job Corps, another partner that we have. These are all different nets that we partner with because listen when you when you cast a line in the in the water the remember the picture of the one guy standing on the side of the river how many fish is he going to catch if he's by himself with one line in the water he might get a couple and if he's really good he might catch his limit but what happens if you have a whole bunch of people on either side of the, the that bank there's another picture i want you to see here and and it's if you've ever been to a fishing derby There's so many lines in the water, you don't even know if you're going to get caught to the person next to you or the fish in the water. Um, If you've ever seen, there's there's fishing camps where they use nets, and they can almost guarantee they get almost everything out of that that river in that short amount of time. I kind of feel like that's the way Bernie is. This church has been here for 125 plus years, and there's a lot of ministries. There's over 120 nonprofit ministries in, uh, in Kendall County alone. And what that does, it means that there's a lot of people fishing. There's a lot of people trying to engage lostness in this community. And that's a really good thing. The more, the, the more gaps that are closed, the less likely the fish get through. I think it's probably likely that every person that is born and lives in this city will hear the gospel at least once or twice while they grow up. It's It's very unlikely that someone could be a completely unreached person living in this community. And that's a praise God thing. You know, when you pick up a magazine, we have 22 domestic partners. Um, but there's a whole lot more. There's, there's a whole bunch of other churches that are, are trying to engage lostness. There's groups that are working among our young people at the schools. Uh, we have people working with children over and over and over again. The nets are, are working here. And every time you talk to these guys, if you talk to one of these ministries, they're going to tell you, we found out that there's a community of people that we haven't been able to reach out, and they really need help. So we're going to do this new thing, and I see the gaps getting even smaller. Praise God for that, because this community loves the Lord, and everybody has access and opportunity to follow Jesus, and that is a big deal. But let me tell you, the most important one is the one that you and I have. It's, it's your friends and family and coworkers and classmates. It's when they get to have a relationship with you, Mike, that they get to see Jesus in you. 
And that's the one that draws the most people is when you have relationship with people and they see Jesus in you, they get to see what Jesus looks like in Stephanie. And when they see Jesus in Stephanie, they're like, man, Stephanie, I want to know what is it that makes you this way? Why are you so kind to the people who are around us? Why are you always pouring yourself out and sacrificing for those who are hurting? And, and if you know Stephanie, she literally does this, you know? Um, how, how is it and why is it you do this? And you get to tell them it's because I have hope in Jesus. You get to tell them that there's, there's this, this truth that can change everything. We sang about it this morning. There are so many amazing ministries. Um, you know, we have the local and domestic ones that are in this book today, but we also have international partners. Those international partners are trying to further our reach to places where the gospel's never been. Uh, we have two teams going out this summer. We're going to pray for them at the end of the service. There's a page about them later on in the, in the manual here. We have a team going to the Yucatan that's going to work with our church planters there. And we have a team going to Turkey and Moldova um, that are going to work with, with uh, the church in Turkey, which is a very small church. They think there's 10,000 believers among a population of 85 million. It's one of the largest unreached people groups on the planet. And we're going to get to just partner and talk to those pastors and find out how you love and care for the lost in such a different environment. We're going to go to Moldova and spend five day, seven days there working with the church in Moldova, sharing the hope of the gospel in the poorest country in all of Europe. Like those are things that we're doing so that those nets can be strengthened and expanded where the, where the gospel is, is hard to find in a different place. You know, here at the church, we have a lot of different nets that are in the water trying to engage and care for people. We have men's ministries and women's ministries. We have a men's, men's retreat coming up next weekend. And it's a great place for Christian men to gather. But if you have non-believing men that are in your life and you think they would enjoy, it'd be a great place for them to come and find a community of, of believing men who might love them and care for them and, and encourage them to be faithful in their lives. We have all kinds of retreats for our youth and children's ministry. There's camps coming up this summer. You know, there's a, a ministry that's, that, that's built on this concept called the 414 window. Have you ever heard of the 414 window? The 414 window says that 90% of Christians come to faith between the ages of 4 and 14. And so how are we engaging that community for the gospel? Because it's probably the most likely place that someone's going to find the hope of the gospel. How many of you became believers between the ages of 4 and 14? Look at that. There's a lot of people in the room that put that hand up. And how many of you would you say was at a Christian camp? I came to faith at a Christian camp. How many of you, it was because of a VBS? Those kind of things just bring in the families of our community and we have the opportunity to share the love of Jesus with them. It's another type of net. It's another way that we can try to close the gaps that someone might miss and not know that Jesus is at work. We have all these other ministries like Starlight Ball last week. We had 70 plus families. Some of them go to our church. Many of them don't. Just come so we can love on them and care for their special needs children and have an incredible event where we ex showed extraordinary love for them. It was phenomenal. We did it last year and this year. It really was such an incredible thing. It's an opportunity for us to love people that are outside. Us. Bernie Bright. You know what that is, guys? It's a big, giant fishing net. <laughs> you throw it out there, and people walk through and look at all the lights, and they get the free hot chocolate, and then we spend some time with them in the prayer garden, and some of them get to hear the gospel for the first time. But if nothing else, they know there's a place here they can go if they're finding a hard, a hard time in life or if they need to find the hope of the gospel. It's another net over and over again. The Christmas choir concert, it's an opportunity for us to invite people to come and hear about Jesus. We sing about him. We talk about him. We pray for people. Our Easter witness campaign, we just finished it. We're trying to encourage you to start engaging the people in your life who are close to you and far from God and share ways. It's all about fishing, folks. It's the reason that we're here to encourage each other, to strengthen each other, to equip each other for the task of taking the gospel to the lost. It's the so that, if you listen to the podcast, why does God bless us? Why does he shine his face on us? Why does he welcome us into his family? It's so that through us, he can do the same thing for those who are far from him. Over and over and over again, we see this in scripture. We just started a Spanish language ministry. You've probably seen some of the signs. We, we have a, a growth group in Spanish during the first service, and we have translation available during the second service. And it's because when we start looking at our community, over 30% of our school district is Hispanic. Do you know that? But when we look at our community here, we're underrepresented in that space. 
So how do we engage a very real part of our own population in Bernie here in our church? Well, let's say we're going to try to provide some Spanish ministry opportunities and see if God will bring a different part of our community into these walls. It's another net, right? We're, pa- we're casting it out there. Uh, yesterday, one of our members invited me to their home and said, hey, I want to start reaching out to my neighbors, but I don't know how to do it. I'm kind of nervous to go door to door. Would you go with me? So I said, sure, let's go. So we walked and we met a couple of people. It was amazing. Every single door we knocked on, someone opened it, which is very different than my experience in the past. Normally you knock on like eight doors before you get one to open. All the ones we went to opened, which was incredible. One of the young ladies that came to the door was telling us about how her family is is new to the the city and her dad is is Iranian. And I started this in my heart laughing, like, you know how difficult it would be for me to train you and send you to Iran? And here, right here in Bernie, I know there's Hispanics that live here, but I didn't know that there's Iranians that live here. And so what an opportunity, just next door to one of our own members, he can minister to a family that has an Iranian person that was born there. What an incredible, you know, it's so difficult to get into that country and still God has brought them right into our backyard. We would never know it if we didn't go knock on the door. And let me tell you, we weren't trying to be, you know, overt, uh, um, what's the word, aggressive Christians. We just asked them, hey, we want to get to know our neighbors. We asked, how can we pray for you? Is there something we can do to pray for you? We're believers. I ask everyone in our neighborhood, can we pray for you? And, uh, and they were like, oh, uh, yeah, sure. You know, someone, one of my family members had a car accident a few weeks ago. So we prayed for them. But an incredible way. So hopefully we'll be able to start building on some of those friendships and relationships. That's a simple way to engage the work of the gospel. All of these things I'm describing, they're all nets, right? They're all different ways to cast the line. Uh, You know, we're not the only church in Bernie trying to do this. And so what an incredible thing that the, the network of God's people in this city makes it very difficult for someone to live their life here and not find Jesus. But there's another truth that I think you need to be aware of. The gospel says, go make disciples of all nations. And a sad truth is that that's not the case in a lot of places in the world today. That tight net with small gaps that we can talk about here in this community is not the way it is in many places in the world. There are people in communities around the world that are unreached, and it means that they have no access to the gospel. Think about this. That means they can be born, live their whole lives, and die never knowing one Christian, never passing one church, never seeing one Bible that they can read. That's the reality for a third of the planet's population. Almost three billion people are considered unreached. So think back again, the guy standing on the edge of the the river with one line in the water, trying to catch one fish at a time. How many of those fish that are not even close to that lure are gonna perish and spend eternity far from God? There's a work that we have that all of us are a part of, and that's, that's what we call missions. Missions is us working together to close those gaps and make it possible for all lost people throughout all the nations to hear the word of God. And so this is the task of the church, capital C, global church. It's the task of all churches to raise up and equip their membership to, yes, engage the lostness in their communities, but also to send some who will go to the ends of the earth, to the places that we can't go to, the places where the gospel has never been. We've done that in our own church. Just last January, we prayed for and sent a couple and a family out of our, out of our church that is working in one of the most difficult places in the world. They're learning the language and they're, they're starting to do outreach among the, the population in that area. And what an incredible thing for us to be part of. So when you give to your church, when you give here at FBC, some of what you give goes to provide for those types of opportunities and needs around the world. Again, think about those nets. They're closing. They're engaging with places where it's never been. I want to show you a, a graphic real quick. This is a world map. And I know it's pretty small, but the red, can you see the red? Every red dot represents an unreached people group. And that means they have no access or very limited access. Less than 2% evangelical Christian is the technical definition for those red dots. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but there's one place that has a lot of high concentration. Do you see it? It's the red blob if you're not close enough to see the dots. That red blob is Southeast Asia. Almost almost two-thirds of the unreached people that live on planet Earth live in that country. That country is India, if you weren't sure. 
And I've heard, I've heard missionaries say this, and I'll just, I'll say it to you, and you can take it for what it, they said, if you don't know where God is calling you, then you should assume it's India, because that's the biggest need. <laughs> right? Hey, all you guys giggling, I got, a, I got a list for you to sign up at the back of the room. <laughs> Almost over a billion people live in that country alone, the most populated country on the planet. And in that place today, it's getting harder and harder to share the gospel. Uh, just last weekend, we had uh, a lady among us. Um, she shared her story during the growth groups, and she talked about how difficult it is to share the gospel in that space. There are literally pastors who are losing their lives because of the gospel. There are churches that have been burned down. Uh, there's persecution on a very high level in some specific places, but they fear that it's going to spread to other parts of India. So a major part of our conversation was really working through how we can encourage her. And you know, I asked her, what would be the most important thing we can pray for as a church? And I'm telling you, without even skipping a beat, she said, pray for those who persecute us. We don't want to spend eternity with them, not with us. You think, my goodness. In the middle of all of my concerns, praying for those who are hurting the people that I love is not one of those highlights. So here we go. How do we land this plane? How do, we, how, do we, how do we kind of get to the end of what we're talking about? I want to tell you it's simple. Start fishing. <laughs> Start preparing. Get ready for the harvest that God is going to bring to his people. Start making yourself available to engage the lost here in our community for sure. But then make the things that God has given you available for those who are other places far from us. Pray for those who are persecuted. Pray for those persecutors. Uh, our, 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 our partner from India kept saying, pray that they would go from Saul to Paul, right? Pray that they would become the next Paul, that they would give their lives for the gospel. Maybe that they would go from taking lives for the gospel to giving their lives for the gospel. Prepare your nets. There's, there's another graphic here, and I love this one. It's one that I've used a lot uh, with some different blogs that I've written over the years. It's this idea that the further out they go, and the broader it goes, then the more likely we're going to catch the, the fish. And, and we're praying that God would help us continue to expand and strengthen those nets. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, it says this. It says, therefore, if anyone is, Christ, is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Do you know what reconciliation means? It means that, that, that God made us right with him. The things that, we were, that divided us from him were, were solved and now we can be in right relationship. And now it says he's given us this, relation, this, this ministry that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Listen to this last line. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on God's behalf, be reconciled to God. God is writing a letter on your heart that the world gets to read. And what is your letter saying? I hope it's saying, come and follow Jesus. He can give you the hope that you're missing. But we have to do that to cast that net. So here's a couple things. Here's some, some simple things. How do you strengthen your nets? First, by abiding deeply in your Lord. John 15 says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Spend time daily with the Lord. Seek him in his word. Spend time with him daily in prayer. It's the foundation for any fishing of men you might do is being connected to him. Second, pray for the lost that you see and you know, the ones who are close to you and far from God. We call it your oikos map, right? It's the map of those, your relational network. Second, be among them. Go be around the lost. Put yourself in close proximity to them so they can see you and you can know them. And yeah, that means that you're going to be around them. That should be a very healthy thing for you. Four, start fishing. Pray that the Lord of harvest will call them his own. Start conversations, gospel conversations that bring up spiritual matters in their life. Ask him how you can pray for them. Ask him if they've ever met Jesus. Ask him if they want to study scripture with you. Those are all invitations. They're, they're low context. You're not saying turn or burn, folks. Like you're saying this is, this is a way to love the lost. Is ask him often and regularly because you're close to them. 
Lastly, make disciples of those who respond, those who are struggling. If you know believers who are not actively engaging the lost, start discipling them. Help them to see this is what we're called to do. If you're not actively engaging lost people, then you need to grow in your faith because it's the end point of mature salvation. Lastly, if you're not sure how to do any of these things, man, come and talk to me. I would love to train you. We're going to do a, a gospel conversation training, we think, on May 18th. I don't have it all scheduled. We'll, we'll send out an email this week. And, and if you want to come to that training, we'd love to get you trained. We try to have one once a quarter just to teach people the basics. How do you start conversations with lost people? Remember the beginning when I talked about those special fishing days where you catch one every time you cast? Pray that God would give us an opportunity to see a harvest like that among the men and women of this community where every time we open the doors and share the hope of the gospel that people come to faith. Think about that verse. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. Lord, give us such days. As we close and the worship team comes back up, I want to just say to a couple of different groups, if you have never made Jesus your Lord, if you're one of those fish we're talking about today that's never really felt like God was, was real to you, then today is a day where you get to respond in a meaningful way. If you haven't ever asked Jesus to be your king, today is the right day to start. Right where you're at, you can say a simple prayer like, Jesus, fill my life. Be my king. Forgive me of my sin and help me to follow you. And if you're a believer and you, you really have never felt like this is the, the action that you're called to, you feel like, duh, I'm too nervous to share my faith. If you're not sure what that's going to look like, then my goodness, today ask the Lord to burden you for the things that burden his heart. Jesus was the best missionary example you can have. He left the comfort of heaven and came and lived in this broken world. He sacrificed himself for the lost people that he saw day in and day out. And that continues for all of the world, including you and I. His sacrifice covers our sin. But are you willing to follow him in his life? To take all that God's given you and give it back and say, Lord, use me in any way that you would call. If you're a believer and you're not sure what that looks like, then today's a day to both repent and say, Lord, forgive me for putting my life in front of you, my desires in front of yours. And then ask him to pull people's heart, minds, their faces into your minds so that you can start praying for those. Again, people who are close to you and far from God. If you've never been equipped, then let us train you to become fishers of men. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word, and we pray, God, that you would be honored in our lives. God, we, we thank you so much that you have included people that have gone before us, that have opened the hearts and minds of our ancestors who followed Jesus, God, of our parents who led us to Jesus, God, or just the people that came into our lives, camp leaders or, or children's workers, God, or a, a man or woman that came in and, and said things that drew our hearts to you, God, and you became real to us. We pray, God, that you would now take our lives and use them for your kingdom and your glory. Father, be honored in us. In your name we pray. Amen. In these next few minutes, these altars are open. We'll have people ready to pray for you. Some people have ministered and prayed. So as we sing, respond as the Lord leads.